toliko vanjkoj bilo. V zobi tam še bo daš menova koj koj ekipe na jaz, in desi nekaj, s priživi šan do tem. Kaj jo je so nekaj mili novodje, in tudi pa bi htel, tudi so bi baz, a pa če je zdi, ki en dan prižaja, no ima vsi man, v ovega mi bom, a pa če je zdi, ki en dan menova prižaja, no ima kar vlek, a kaj, če bo daš mišče so gej, a ne, a kaj, če bo daš menova kar bro, res nekaj tudi malo tega, a pa če je zdi, ki en dan in bi kjet. Or as we like to say in, in English, hey, how's it going? <laughs> Without a paddle. <laughs> so the next story in the legends are 
how are you going to miss the paddle? <laughs> and then much later on, he figures out the, uh, the technology of the birch bark canoe. And uh, so the canoe is actually a, a prominent part of our cosmology, of our vision, of uh, the history of these lands. And so it's good to see that recognized. And uh, I think it's important for all of us to, to, to reflect on that and to, to make sure that that forms a part of our our education for people uh, in this part of the world. Because if we, we think of the role that the canoe had, it really, you know, it might sound like a stretch, but it, it can really break down a lot of the rhetoric and a lot of the stereotypes um, that we still are encumbered with uh, to this day in Canada. You know, we hear the, the talk of, you know, the, the chiefs are earning these outrageous salaries, right? It's actually untrue, right? If you do the research, you find out that most chiefs uh, make around sixty thousand dollars a year. Right? But still, that's the perception that's out there, and there's a perception that you know First Nations communities are you know bad with money and don't understand economy and don't understand uh, the value of hard work and all this sort of you know subtly <laughs> subtly racist rhetoric that uh, permeates the public discourse uh, too often in this country. But uh, there's actually a very compelling argument against that. Right? There's a very compelling proof that indigenous people do understand economy, do understand uh, the value of hard work, do understand how to make a living and how to uh, benefit from trade. And uh, it is the fur trade. Right? That is the proof. That is the original economic boom uh, following European contact. Right? The original economic boom in this part of the world was the fur trade, and it was uh, one that was facilitated in large measure with the technology of the canoe. Right? And so you see that that heritage uh, celebrated here. And so I don't think it's a stretch to say that in teaching about the canoe, not only do we get the rich social and cultural side, we can also do a bit of uh, Myth busting as well, right? And, and, and learn to celebrate uh, what is, um, you know, the original trade relationship, economic relationship, and uh, relationship based on good, hard, honest work that was forged in these lands uh, going back hundreds of years. So I thought that that was uh, a good place to start off. Once this relationship, you know, had existed in an informal way for a few decades, it began to be formalized, you know, in treaties, right? And this is actually, this is actually one of the earliest treaties, you know, was the, uh, the two-row wampum relationship between the Haudenosaunee and the Dutch. And this is actually a depiction of canoes. Right? The agreement that the Dutch and the Haudenosaunee made is that we are going to make a treaty with one another and this is what our relationship is going to be. Two canoes traveling in the river on parallel, equal paths, neither interfering with the other. The two row wampum. There's rich symbolism encoded in that. Even the three rows of beads in between the two canoes traveling down the river has a meaning. Right? The Haudenosaunee elders will tell you that those three rows of beads in the middle represent the values that are necessary to sustain the relationship. The values of peace, power, and righteousness. And if we approach one another with those values in mind, in our hearts, in our mind, uh, we will be able to, to have a relationship uh, that lives up to the vision encoded on those wampum belts. And then from these wampum belts, then you eventually got into the Peace and Friendship Treaties, and then the Pre-Confederation Treaties, and then eventually the Numbered Treaties. But then by the time you got to British Columbia, you know, in the uh, turn of the uh, 20th century, it was no longer necessary for Indigenous people to be military allies to maintain the integrity of the Canadian state. So settlement in that region proceeded without treaty making. And that accident of history has resulted now in a situation where First Nations in British Columbia have 
among the strongest legal standing of any indigenous nation in these lands. So it's not a stretch to say that, again, the canoe is present uh, in this treaty-making relationship, nation-to-nation -nation, um, you know, interface that we have uh, been engaged in these past uh, hundreds of years. And so it's a, it's a rich history. There's a, another teaching I wanted to share from one of those treaties that was uh, shared where I'm from, at the signing of Treaty 3. So Treaty 3 was, the final negotiations and the signing took place on Northwest Angle, which is the northwest side of uh, Lake of the Woods. I grew up on uh, the east side, close to um, the Almo Peninsula. And uh, at the signing of Treaty 3, this chief, Sadechue, oh, yeah, not aligned perfectly well. There we go. My knight in shining armor. <laughs> so that's what his name means, Sadechue, that image there. It's a rising day. So this chief, Sagachiwe, he said, give us one of your sons and one of your daughters, and we'll give you one of our sons and one of our daughters. You teach our son and daughter how to live like you. We'll teach your son and daughter how to live like us. And in this way, we'll be able to live on these lands together. We'll be able to share the land. It's a remarkable vision, right? Like 142 years ago, this guy had it figured out already. He understood that education was going to be key to this project of sharing the land. He understood that education was, and understanding each other's ways of life was going to be foundational to fulfilling the treaty relationship. Sadly, only half of that equation was fulfilled. We fast forward 142 years and just last week, you know, this happened. Uh, these two toddlers died in a house fire in Saskatchewan uh, after the uh, fire chief from the nearby town, the mayor, uh, got the 911 call and then decided not to respond because the First Nation had an outstanding balance of $3,400. And then he went back to sleep. And, uh, Toddlers perished in the fire. Who knows whether responding would have saved their lives, but uh, certainly doesn't look good. All right. So here, here's where we are today. You know, the we're definitely traveling in two different canoes, right? Because in one canoe, do we value babies, toddlers? Yeah. Do we assign a value to them? greater than $3,400? Yeah. But if you're in this canoe, apparently that logic doesn't apply. At least not everywhere. Yeah. And that's disturbing, right? So however you choose to frame it, whether we're traveling in different canoes, whether we're speaking different languages, whether we're <laughs> engaged in different conversations, there is a disconnect. So how did we get here? Well, most of the relationships first were codified um, into treaty form, right? But many of them uh, were, were, were summarily broken. For instance, uh, you could argue that Treaty 3 was violated before it was even executed. Because Treaty 3, the negotiations took place over two years, right? Because the the Shinobi chiefs drove a hard bargain and they wanted to extract a lot of concessions. And so they drove a hard bargain and it took two years. And then following this process, basically what the, the, the Queen's emissary said was, uh, okay, you, you chiefs are ready to sign? Okay, great. All right, bring a copy of Treaty 2 in here and have the chiefs sign that, right? So it just didn't reflect any of the negotiations, any of the discussion that had taken place there. Right? And the reason why we know this is because Treaty 3 one of the one of the treaties where the chiefs kept a recording of the promises that they agreed to. It's called the Paypal document. And if you hold up the chief's version of Treaty 3 and compare it to the Queen's version of Treaty 3, there's a marked difference between the two. Right? So 
That, if not exactly the experience in all regions, is sort of emblematic or typifies the experience uh, of many different nations who entered the treaty relationships with the crown. Following, uh, following the treaties, you know, came the imposition of the Indian Act, and uh, to this day, I still carry a status card in my pocket, blank, blanked up for my uh, treaty number there, so you guys can't go by uh, <laughs> uh, gas. I not that I don't trust you. <laughs> I don't want a bunch of questions later on. Why were you really in Kirby? <laughs> Yeah, and so the Indian Act, you know, it was imposed after uh, most of the treaties in this country were signed. And what it served to do, or I guess what the impact was in our communities, was that it removed economic opportunity. That was the huge impact, right? Because it removed the freedom of mobility. So the old Indian status cards, from going back into the 1930s, 1940s, they had lines on the back of them. And the lines were for the Indian agent to sign and give you permission to leave the reserve. And if you didn't have that sign, you would be arrested and put in the jail. Right? So there's no freedom of mobility for a long time. And uh, again, if you wanted to take anything to market, agricultural goods, you know, manufactured goods, again, you needed written permission of the Indian agent. So every aspect of your life now became managed by a, a government official, who typically was uh, not somebody who had your best interests in mind. Some of the aspects of the Indian Act are, uh, that are strange still exist with us to this day. Like, for instance, um, if I were to die in a reserve today, my last will and testament uh, would not take legal effect. So the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs in Ottawa would have a final say on what happens to the property that I own, the invest investment instruments that I have, any cash that I have, all that stuff. Right? So the artifacts of a very archaic and uh, paternalistic piece of legislation. And the Indian Act also empowered the residential school era. It created the legislative framework for residential schools uh, to uh, be implemented in this country with uh, federal government funding. And you know when those parts of the Indian Act were repealed, the parts that gave legal force to the residential school era, they were repealed in late 2014, about two or three months ago. Right? So we are very much still dealing with the colonial past in this country. Right? Like some people get touchy around the word colonialism, but it's pretty difficult to argue when you consider that you know, laws like that are still on the books. Of course, residential schools came came into our communities uh, around this time, before the turn of the century. The photo of my late father with my son, and it was taken at the uh, site of the former residential school. It was it's since been torn down, and uh, you know it's funny how we acknowledge and honor and commemorate, and yet try and find a way to to move on. Um, when this residential school was torn down, probably in the late seventies. You know, my dad went there and he took some of the artifacts out and took some of the things that were used when he was a child home. And so when I was a kid, I used to like wake up in the morning, we're running into the kitchen and fight over the stool. We all wanted to sit at the, the stool, right, instead of just a boring old chair. <laughs> you know, to fight over the stool to eat our cereal. But uh, it turns out this was a stool that kids were sat down on and had their heads shaved on when they were first brought into the residential school. And then he had a belt that he took out of the school grounds as well. So it was very powerful for me uh, a week ago to be on Vancouver Island and to hear about them uh, tearing down the uh, former residential school on the island there and to hear how you know my good friend Bobby Joseph and uh, some of the other residential school survivors made a big ceremonial showing of it with, with dance and uh, song and culture and ceremony and made it not just a demolition of a site that had caused them harm, but also a, a, a reclamation and a reappropriation of space, and also a reassertion of uh, the very culture that was intended to be destroyed in these institutions. One of the very cultures that was intended to be destroyed. So the residential school era, you know, 
is something that we're still grappling with in the indigenous community you know, for these very you know, physical manifestations and to say nothing about the emotional, and spiritual, and cultural um, harm that was wrought over this, over this period. And to me, this is sort of like the, the damaging trifecta of colonialism uh, in this part of the world. Right? Like up until, you know, the, uh, the treaty-making settlement era, you know, indigenous people were still empowered. Indigenous nations were still, you know, forces to be reckoned with in these lands. But through the breaking of the treaties, the imposition of the Indian Act, and then the start of the residential school era, that was where things really took a dark turn for indigenous uh, peoples in this part of the world. So where are we today? Well, if you look at the stories, like the one from Saskatchewan that I spoke about, you know, it, it's very discouraging. The socioeconomic indicators are grim, you know. Life expectancy is a number of years shorter for indigenous people. Uh, median income is about $10,000 lower uh, per person per year. Educational outcomes are fairly dismal. Manitoba, where I live, uh, on the 62 First Nations in Manitoba, the high school graduation rate is 26%. Right? One in four kids only uh, will graduate high school. You're actually more likely as a First Nations man to go to jail than to, to graduate from high school in uh, that part of the country. Right? But that's not the whole story. There's also 27,000 Indigenous people in post-secondary uh, institutions right now. First Nations, Métis, Inuit people are starting businesses at a rate two and a half times faster than everyone else in the country. For an Indigenous woman with the same level of education as an Indigenous man, <laughs> she will earn more money after graduation. Right? So there is a gender pay gap, but it's the reverse of what exists <laughs> in the national average. Right? And what I would like to say, like, why is that? And then, you know, it's not a quite way. Well, that's because we work hard. <laughs> and then, like, no, there was more racist to us. <laughs> the, you know, it's probably a combination of many things that accounts for that, right? But I think there is some element of truth to the fact that if you go to many, especially First Nations communities, often the people, the technical staff, the people running things behind the scenes are First Nations women. So because of that, there's been you know, uh, a greater drive to professional career paths, uh, potentially. And then that has kind of a multiplying effect on uh, people from uh, similar backgrounds who come, who come after them. So there is that same <coughs> dynamic across all communities in Canada. Young women are getting educated at a rate uh, faster than young men are. That's true for everybody, but it's, it's more acute more pronounced, I should say, in the indigenous community. And so, I would say we're in a period of an indigenous resurgence, and this is a language that uh, indigenous academics use, you know. John Ralston Thal says it's a comeback. I was teasing him, you know, I, I like his book, I think he was a friend. I was teasing him, I said, you know, this great poet, LL Cool J. <laughs> <laughs> Don't call it a comeback, I've been here for years. <laughs> and, and you know, John Ralston saw it, he recognized it, right? Because that's the message in his book. It's like, you know, indigenous people haven't changed. They've been saying the same thing for hundreds of years. It's the rest of the country that's sort of coming around. And so we're in this period now of an indigenous resurgence. You know, it's a photo of my wife there, and she sort of typifies this. You know, she's a medical doctor, finished her, you know, uh, MD when she was 26, and has been out there practicing. Uh, for a number of years, type A personality, very successful financially, professionally, career-wise, but uh, still goes to the Sundance in the summertime. Still strongly connected to indigenous language and culture, right? And that's the face of the indigenous resurgence. It's another face, uh, my little sister, Shawnee Benansi, Kate Nashi Kinu. And, uh, you know, this photo was taken when she uh, uh, received her master's degree from Harvard University, and now she's finishing her, her doctoral degree. And she'll have her PhD from uh, the best university in the world in 
well, next year, yeah. right? <laughs> and um, you know, the federal government hasn't paid any money towards your education. It's not because you're on programs like that, it's because she's there on full academic scholarship, right? There's a bidding war for her when she graduated uh, from University of Toronto with her BA. And uh, therefore, you know, it's fair to say she's among the brightest in her field at her age in the whole world, right? And she's a young First Nations woman from the middle of nowhere in Northwestern Ontario, right? And similarly, before she went to Harvard, she went to the sweat, she went to the Sundance, she went to the pipe ceremony. And so that's the face of the indigenous uh, resurgence, young, educated, proud, and empowered. You know? And think about her life experience, right? Growing up in this country and going on now to live in Rome, right? Rubbing shoulders with the, uh, you know, trust fund babies and, you know, people who uh, come from royalty, literally, rubbing shoulders with the the movers and shakers of the world, living in the global centers of power. Right? So why would she come back here to be called a squaw? Right? This cover made big, uh, made a big splash in Winnipeg, right? But I think the rest of the country missed the point. They're saying there is a race pro racism problem in Canada. And yeah, it's worse in Winnipeg, but that doesn't mean everyone else is doing great. <laughs> right? Whereas everyone, I think, saw the cover and they're like, whoa, Winnipeg sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's what McClane was saying. There's one part in this article that I think is the most valuable contribution. It's actually just a little infographic, like a little you know, a graph that they published there. And it compares the gap in socioeconomic indicators between Aboriginal people in the rest of Canada versus the gap between African Americans and the rest of the U.S. And by and large, the gap is more pronounced in Canada. Okay? It's a bit of a wake-up call in the work that needs to be done. And I point this out because, you know, we, First Nations people, Métis people, Inuit people, we know the damage that colonialism has done. We know the damage that structural inequality in this country uh, does in a very real way because we have shouldered that burden. But the thing that you ought to understand is that everyone in this country is worse off for it. Right? Like you're missing out on having people such as my little sister being a part of the social cultural fabric of this country contributing to the economic well-being of this country. Right? There's actually research that, that looks into quantifying this, and they found that if you were to level a playing field in education and uh, access to employment in this country, GDP would rise by $170 billion and within two years. And if you carried that out over 10 years, government expenditures on social services would decline by $400 billion. Right? You can quantify the fact that this country is worse off for its failure to do right by indigenous people. Right? But to me, it's more than just that. Right? It's not just about the dollars and cents. Right? It's a question of how much richer could our public sphere be if every young Anishinaabe kid in this country had an ability to contribute their intellect you know, contribute to the public discourse of these lands, could contribute fully to all our communities with volunteerism and other public expressions of uh, their goodwill and vitality. Right? And so we're all missing out on the true potential of this country because of our refusal as a collective, you know, I'm not pointing the finger at individuals, but as a collective, our refusal to to do right by the greatest social justice issue uh, facing uh, this country. So I wanted to toot my own horn for a bit and uh, tell you about some of the things we're doing at the University of Winnipeg to um, level the playing field. So we have this one program called Young Entrepreneurs. It's basically Dragon's Den, you know, 
teach young people how to start a business by developing a business plan, taking that to angel and investors, pitching it to them, and then you know heading out on their own. And uh, there's a number of programs like this, right? Like Spirit from the Business Development Bank, uh, the Martin Aboriginal Initiative has a similar program. But what's unique about the one we do, and we're now scaling it up and launching it nationally in a partnership with Cape Breton University, is that we incorporate indigenous cultures with it, right? So in addition to learning about business, we also learn about culture from elders and spiritual people. And so they'll learn, for instance, you know, if you're going to take something from the forest, you should make an offering, give something back, right? And then we bring that learning back into the business environment and say, okay, so what would happen for a timber operation if they had to make an offering every time they cut down a tree? Or what would happen to a diamond mine if they had to offset the impact that they were having on the earth around them? Right? Then it becomes this whole interesting discussion and a teaching opportunity where we can kind of show how some indigenous concepts from the indigenous worldview begin to match up with some contemporary management theory like triple bottom line accounting, or the four pillars of sustainability, or in economics, the idea of trying to internalize your externalities. And it's also a chance for us to uh, send a couple of young people to Vegas. Because <laughs> they get to go and participate in the Reservation Economic Summit, 20 grand business plan competition. And this is uh, exactly what it sounds like. It's a Dragon's Den style contest, and the winner gets 20 grand. So Kelly, our winner, was a, came in second place down in Vegas, you know, competing with real, legit business types and PhDs and entrepreneurs and people with uh, big financial backers. And so we come back to Canada and we're able to show off Kelly, you know, to Winnipeg. Because in Winnipeg, you know, the idea of an urban reserve is kind of uh, contentious, shall we say. Like I think people think an urban reserve is going to be, you know, stray dogs running around, whatever. But it's not, right? Like his business plan was to build a boutique hotel on an urban reserve in Canada. And it's an amazingly detailed business plan. His financials, financial projections go up seven years. He's realistic, like he doesn't break even until like year six, right? Usually, a person makes a business plan, it's like, Start the business in year one, we're making 10 million. This <laughs> <laughs> no, is very realistic, right? Like, very, very realistic. He went to IKEA, shopped for all the furniture, he did 3D renderings for how the hotel was going to look, what all the rooms would look like inside, right? So we can show them off and say an urban reserve isn't that. An urban reserve is this. An urban reserve is young, hardworking, innovative, entrepreneurial, indigenous people as your neighbor, right? Not so scary. We have this uh, Ojibwe language program called Anishinaabe Monatawatanege Anunjie. Our language is uh, good if you want to work out on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> but it means let's speak Ojibwe to our kids. And uh, you know we teach language by just bringing together the young generation with the older generation and have them do activities together. And we do do cultural activities, you know, singing, and, you know. Uh, making you know, ceremonial items and things like that. But the things that, that have been most exciting to us, because they've energized the kids the most, have been activities based in science, technology, engineering, and math, right? And so you see them there building rockets on the far side, and uh, the rockets are like a, like a toilet paper tube with a film canister inside it, and you decorate it, and then put like Diet Coke and Mentos inside the film canister. It's a very big challenge for us to find uh, film canisters <laughs> <laughs> today, but uh, we managed to plow through. The other one, they're uh, extracting DNA from strawberries using cell lysis, right? And they learn the vocabulary for the chemical, biological processes uh, in Ojibwe, right? They learn astronomy in Ojibwe, right? They learn, you know, uh, the countdown for their rocket launch in Ojibwe, right? And then they learn that there's a, a base 10 number system in the language, a base five number system, and then we can talk about math, and then we can talk about science, we can take it in all these different directions. So we're able to build all these different lesson plans um, grounded in the language and accomplish multiple goals at the same time. 
one level we're doing language and culture retention, on another level we're doing science, technology, engineering, and math uh, teaching, and then on the tertiary level we're helping to normalize the university environment. Right? The University of Winnipeg is in downtown inner city Winnipeg. Right? And so for families such as mine, uh, it was always expected that we would all go to university. Right? Like that was a bare minimum. But in the neighborhood where we are located as the University of Winnipeg, um, a lot of the families in our, our neck of the woods uh, don't have that. They don't have university grads or you know, people with post-secondary credentials. And so we're able to bring in you know, people and say, no, nope, this is the place you belong. People like you have been engaged in intellectual inquiry like this for hundreds, thousands of years. And uh, if that's something that excites you, then you belong here. And this is a place that you can have fun. Indigenous people are also brought into the governance structure of the U of W through uh, an Indigenous Advisory Circle. These photos were taken at an event that the Advisory Circle hosted, um, asking whether there should be an inquiry into the sea murder of uh, Indigenous women. And uh, it was a packed house. We had about 400 people show up. And it um, was webcast online, and I know at least one person was watching. <laughs> so uh, that's good. But uh, I wanted to share this with you because I think it's a, it's a model that I think a lot of universities are using nowadays, right? Like you form a council or a committee of you know, leaders from the indigenous community, whether they be political leaders or business leaders or community leaders in some other respect. And that's actually one of the places that we're taking it now in Winnipeg is working with our new mayor, Mayor Bowman, to, to design an indigenous advisory circle for the city of Winnipeg, right? And the idea isn't to insert um, indigenous people uh, into uh, the process where they don't belong, but rather it's to try and rectify uh, some of the past um, inequities which today manifest as a disenfranchisement or a disconnect between the indigenous community and uh, the circles of power, quarters of power. And so we have this indigenous advisory circle, not to mention there's two uh, senior executives who are indigenous, myself and the uh, president, and uh, also there's indigenous members of the Board of Regents and on the Senate of the University. So indigenous people um, integrated full up, fully uh, into the governance of our institution. And so I thought I'd talk a bit about what's unique about partnering with First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, because while there is more and more interest in this country in building relationships and building partnerships with the indigenous world, um, and there's more and more people who are engaged in that, I think we have to think a little bit about how we make that approach and what it should look like before we actually you know, reach out in that way. You know, I hear, for instance, I was listening to this presentation about the Energy East pipeline, right? And uh, they were saying, like, yeah, we, we engage all stakeholders, you know, stakeholders like landowners and First Nations and environmental groups and that. It's not just TransCanada that does that, right? The provincial government here in Ontario does the same thing, right? Like stakeholders, like First Nations, Métis. Yeah. Former National Chief Phil Fontaine has a nice, you know, concise way of uh, rebutting that. Right? We're not stakeholders. We are rights holders. <laughs> and it's true. Right? Like the other groups that corporations or governments engage with. Uh, our stakeholders because they have a stake in the development. But the interest for First Nations, and for Métis, and for Inuit people is different. It's based on the fact that we have constitutionally entrenched rights in this country. Right? Like the duty to consult is the legal standard which forces these people, uh, these organizations, uh, these corporations to engage with us. And the legal standard of the duty to consult arises out of Section 35 of the Constitution. Section 35 of the Constitution, Aboriginal and treaty rights are recognized and affirmed. Right? So the law backs up what Phil is saying here. But the Chilcotin decision last year expanded the legal standing of some First Nations groups in this country. So in the parts of this country where treaties were not signed, or where the land was not ceded as part of treaties, meaning most of British Columbia 
most of Atlantic Canada, a huge part of the north, a big chunk of Quebec, and parts of Ontario, uh, on Manitoulin Island, for instance, as well as some of the independent First Nations in uh, Ontario here. The standard isn't consultation, right? Because consultation is sort of a soft standard, right? I can consult with you, and then if I don't like what you tell me in the consultation, I can still do whatever I want. But in those areas that I just described that are not covered by treaty or that still retain Aboriginal title, the standard is higher. The standard is consent. Right? So I was sitting with Chief Grand Chief Stuart Phillip, who's um, Grand Chief of uh, a huge number of the uh, First Nations in the interior of British Columbia. I told him this line, I was like, you know, Phil says, we're not stakeholders, we're rights holders, right? And he immediately responded, we're not just rights holders. We are title holders, right? And so this is like the ever-strengthening legal standing of First Nations people in Canada. And, uh, you know, because rights, like what are rights? You know, some, it's like this concept, it's this idea. But title, title is very concrete, right? And it's much, much clearer in that case. And so these are the things that we have to recognize, that in, in these lands, in this part of the world, there's a unique standing for First Nations and the Métis and Inuit people. Like It's not just like engaging anybody else. It's not just like partnering with anybody else. And I think more and more people are starting to realize that and they're starting to you know, build their relationships with this in mind. But I always like to, to put it out there uh, as a reminder. And so in trying to you know, educate people who care about these sort of consultations, we've developed this online training tool uh, turn that off, uh, called Indigenous Insights, an online massive open course. And uh, it's geared towards the corporate sector and the public sector, and it just provides a baseline of knowledge on Indigenous history, culture, and contemporary <coughs> issues, right? So it's like, here's a little bit about the treaties, here's a little bit about residential schools, Here's a little bit about the Indian Act. Here's a little bit about traditional cultures. Here's a little bit about natural resource development in indigenous communities, and so on and so forth. And uh, what I like about it is it looks different than most online courses that you see, right? Most online courses you see is like a videotaped lecture that's been posted on YouTube, where it's like the respect and sport thing, where it's like a, a PowerPoint presentation with a voiceover, right? But this looks more like a TV show, or more like something you might watch on YouTube of your own volition, right? <laughs> and so, to me, what I like about it is that this shows that when you're working in the indigenous space, you don't always just have to be playing catch-up, right? You can actually innovate, you can leapfrog, you can go ahead of what's happening in the mainstream and uh, break some ground and, and do some new and interesting and exciting things. Because, yeah, we're doing the indigenous work, and. Uh, trying to um, level the playing field, but we're also breaking new ground uh, in pedagogy and how we deliver uh, courses online. So we've entered this period of uh, truth and reconciliation, and uh, I wear the pin of uh, the honorary witnesses in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, and uh, that's an important part of the work that I do at the U of W too, try and host forums to educate and bring uh, the, the stories out. But it's also something that I take very seriously uh, beyond um, my professional life. And it's something that is very important to my personal life as well. And uh, the reason why I always make a point of speaking about it in public is because I believe that everyone in this country should fully appreciate the, the history of residential schools, not just because it's a, a dark chapter in our past and we want to avoid uh, things like that happening again. But also because uh, residential school survivors are some of the most um, inspirational, uh, courageous leaders uh, that we have in this country. Right? You know, they overcame such long odds, many of them, uh, in facing tremendous obstacles when they were young and then going on not just to become good human beings and family members and productive members of society in many cases, but also to have these giant institutions, the national governmental apparatus in this country, 
the five biggest churches, including the biggest church in the world, do a full pivot, a full about face because of their demands for justice and come back and tell them, you know what, we were wrong, you were right all along. Right? That's a remarkable story, considering it started when people were just five years old, six years old. Right? And so I think we ought to celebrate their stories and continue to commemorate them. And one of the things that I always like to say is, in my lifetime, I would like to see us establish a, a national statutory federal holiday uh, to commemorate the survivors of Indian residential schools. So that even when this window of the, the, the time we have left with these, these heroes and these elders and these moms and dads and grandpas and grandmas closes, that we still have a public uh, forum to, to share their stories and to remember them and to honor them. And uh, again, to make sure it never happens again but also to celebrate their triumph and uh, their survival. And I believe that it should be done in uh, a ceremony, uh, in an indigenous way, with a dimension of spirituality. You know, I um, participated in the reading of the, the Holocaust scroll at uh, a Jewish temple in Winnipeg, and I was very, very moved and very impressed by how they built into ritual and into ceremony commemoration of the great heroes and survivors uh, of their community. You know, explaining it to me, it made a lot of sense. They said, you know, I can't tell you what I ate for lunch last week, but I can tell you what Moses ate in the desert thousands of years ago. And the reason why is because we recite it over and over, and we read it over and over again. So I think there's something to it, you know, building in a little bit of ceremony, a little bit of uh, ritual, and a little bit of spirituality. And so that's something for all of us to consider. So all of these things that I'm engaged with uh, today, to me, I hope they, they underline the importance of Indigenous culture and Indigenous language. Um, and I think it's easy to understand why it's important to me as an in Indigenous man, or why it's important to build it into our curricula for Indigenous children, right? identity and self-esteem and self-worth and things like that. But I'd also argue that it's important for everybody, not just indigenous people, right? You know, there's the, the argument looking to the past, right, that indigenous uh, contributions to this country are underrepresented and under-celebrated, you know, thankfully not at a place like this, but maybe in the, in the high school and the primary school uh, textbooks. We could do a better job, right? And whether or not you have indigenous blood, indigenous language and culture is part of our collective identity in these lands, right? Like we, for crying out loud, we live in a country with an indigenous name. <laughs> Canada, right? And so how is it that we can understand what it means to be Canadian without fully uh, understanding what Canada is people that uh, spoke the language that gifted us that term, and so on. But uh, there's also an argument facing forward, right? We're entering now, hurtling headlong into a knowledge economy. And the number one creator of value, of wealth, in the knowledge economy is innovation. Do <coughs> you want to be Apple or Xerox, right? You want to be the company that made the iPhone, the iPad, and now the iWatch, and maybe an iCar? <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to be the company that like 70 years ago made a photocopier, still can't make a photocopier? <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Facebook, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, he, uh, he thought of Facebook as a global potlatch when he was scaling it up. Right? And so in this global potlatch, what are the gifts that you're giving? Likes, comments, shares, you know, videos, pictures. And in a traditional potlatch, how do you judge wealth? Well, you don't judge wealth by how much you accumulate, you judge wealth by how much you give away. So in the Facebook potlatch, how do you judge wealth? By the person who hoards the most photos? No, the person who shares the most photos. The person who shares the most likes, the most comments, the most interactions, right? That's the person whose Facebook's algorithms celebrate and make the most salient and prominent. And just like in a traditional potlatch, there's social sanctions if you don't share. Okay? So in the potlatch or in a giveaway culture like ours, if I just go to the giveaways and receive gifts without contributing my own, there's social sanctions. Right? People be like, oh, he's so cheap. <laughs> <laughs> Don't invite him. <laughs> right? Same thing on Facebook, right? Like if you just check it out everybody else's photos, but you don't share any of your own, what happens? Greed, right? <laughs> soccer, soccer. So it's an example of a company that's used indigenous knowledge to drive innovation. Right? And how many more examples uh, could we have if we did a better job of celebrating, of sharing, of incorporating indigenous language and culture uh, into education, but it, again, into all spheres of uh, public life and public discourse in this country. And so, you know, we're at, we're, at a, we're at a crossroads, I would say. Like on the one hand, we have this amazingly strong legal standing for First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people in this country. Like it's only really exceeded uh, at the international level by countries with an indigenous majority, like Ecuador and Bolivia, right? Um, the legal standing, legal recognition is very strong in this country. And yet there's a huge disconnect between the strength of that legal standing and the abysmal quality of life for too many kids uh, at the grassroots level across this country, okay? Like, yeah, we got our you know, Section 35, and we got Chilcotin, and we got, you know, all these court decisions, but still thousands of kids growing up with unclean drinking water, and carrying piss buckets, and living in shacks, right? And you go to some communities in this country, it looks like Afghanistan minus the, minus the, uh, well, I can't even say minus the bullet holes, because you look at the stop sign in the shack, there's bullet holes in them, too. So minus the mortar fire, how about that? There's this other disconnect, right, between the ideals that we celebrate in this country, right? Like as the human rights leader globally, as a defender of, of the peace on the international scene, right? When we still have structural inequality in this country. Like people ask me, wow, is there really racism in this country? Uh, I don't know, you tell me. Uh, if you're a kid on reserve in this country, your school gets $4,000 less per student per year because of where you were born. Is that consistent with the charter? My dad died of pancreatic cancer in Manitoba. In Manitoba, we have a cancer drug coverage program that pays the cost of all cancer drugs for all Manitobans, unless you're First Nations. And so the drug that was recommended for his treatment, he was denied coverage for because he's a First Nations man. Even though if he were just anyone else in the province, he would have been covered. The two babies who died in Saskatchewan that we wouldn't respond to a 911 call for our neighbor over $3,400. Right? That's to say nothing of the name calling or the more overt forms of racism, which unfortunately still do exist. Right? So you tell me, does racism still exist in Canada today? Like, we can have a debate about you know the name calling and the overt stuff, but it's pretty tough to argue with the numbers. Right? and the structural inequality that still exists around education and health and access to the basic necessities of life for too many indigenous people in this country. And so 
while we're at this crossroads, the thing that frustrates me, but also at the same time inspires me, is that I can see the potential. Right? Like, I, I, I look to my little brothers and sisters, and I see the hope and the intellect and the passion amongst so many young indigenous people in this country. Right? And I see how much greater this country could be. Right? And don't get me wrong, I am absolutely 100% a patriot. I love this country. I know how great this country is. And I was reminded of it last night. You know, this country is a fantastic place. And I am fully cognizant of all the opportunities that I have been afforded in these lands. But I know that we can do better. I know that we can do much better in leveling the playing field for all children in this country. I know that we can do better when it comes to fixing the structural in inequities that still permeate the, the laws and funding mechanisms of our government. And I know we can do better just in terms of the simple acts of being native. And so we're at this crossroads. We ought to realize the potential. We ought to see how much richer, how much more vibrant this country could be, how much better off all of us would be together. Were we to fully realize the vision set out in those canoes so long ago. The vision, I'm going to wrap it up, what? <laughs> Were we to realize the vision in those initial treaty relationships, nation to nation relationships, right? And so for me, you know, the answer is simple. Like, I know that everyone in this country believes that they're doing the right thing and wants to do good, right? But sometimes good is not enough. You know, sometimes we have to be great. Sometimes we have to rise up and uh, answer the call of history, right? And to me, this is an historic time. It's an historic time for indigenous people. It's an historic time for the environment. It's an historic time for, for gender and women's rights in this country. And uh, what I ask myself is, you know, what am I going to tell my grandkids, you know, 50 years from now? You know? Well, maybe not around in 50 years. 40 years from now, let's be realistic. You know? They'll say, where were you? Where were you when the oceans were rising? You know? What did you do to make it safer for indigenous women and girls in this country? What did you do to fix things so that kids like me had an equal shot? Right? So that's what drives me. And you know, I'm working hard and hoping that I'll be able to, to look them in the eye and to say, I did something. I did the best that I could. You know, maybe it wasn't perfect, maybe it wasn't everything, but at least I tried. You know? And I would encourage everyone here to ask themselves uh, what they could do. Um, so they'll be able to look at uh, your own grandkids, your own great grandkids in their <coughs> eyes and tell them that you were there at that historic moment you contributed to realizing the, the full great potential uh, of what Canada can really be. So with that, I'll say I'm a coach. Thank you guys uh, for listening to me.